Say something. Okay, we're about to get started here. I just before we get started, I just wanted to check to see if anybody, uh, just to make sure y'all can hear me. If you're virtual, if you don't mind putting a response in the chat, just tell me if you can hear me. Yes. Okay, they can hear me. Okay, great. Great. All right. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Um, I appreciate you being here for the first quarter uh, GIS community meeting. And uh, let's see, do I need to cancel this little, can you see the, the bar on the side? Okay. Um, so my name is Richard Wade. I am the uh, uh, State Geographic Information Officer for Texas. I also serve as the Deputy Executive Administrator at Tenris, and I want to welcome everybody here. Um, so this if you haven't been to a community meeting before, this is something I think that's extremely important. I say this every time we have one, but I think it is critical. Um, Tenris goes through a lot of uh, time uh, making sure you guys understand what we're doing, and we're going to be doing that here with some of our updates. But I think it's important, too, that it uh, it goes both ways and that we understand what you uh, what y'all are doing and also find out what you need. A lot of the things that we actually uh, do as it relates to data, um, we learn from these kinds of meetings. Um, so it's real important that we learn about what y'all are doing. So hopefully what we really want to try to do is make sure that uh, you have what you need, that we understand what you're looking for, and that others uh, know what you're doing as well because there's a lot of overlap in some of the work that we do. And some of the things that you you create are very valuable to people who don't know you actually create it. So it's, uh, you know, this is a community meeting and I wanna make sure that we, you know, that we remember that and that we're not talking at you. This is kind of my, mainly an open forum. So we got a lot going on um, that we really wanna uh, get through here. So let me see if I can make this work. Okay. No, I don't wanna exit. Yeah, there we go. Gotcha. All right. So again, I want to th uh, definitely thank uh, ACC for hosting this meeting here uh, uh, it, in person. Um, if you have not been to the ACC campus, I say this last time too, the ACC campus is absolutely amazing here at Highland. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity to check out the facilities here, you're missing out. Uh, you probably can tell um, if you're virtual about the room and, and uh, the quality of the equipment and the cameras and all that stuff is, is quite amazing. And if you want to speak when the time comes when we do our roll call, um, you can speak normally and the whole room here is going to hear you. They have a great speaker system, a great microphone system. Everything is wonderful. So, uh, Stephanie, I wanted to thank you so much for hosting our event again. And we're going to be doing this not just at ACC, but we're going to kind of be going back and forth to the new text.offices offices as well. So every other meeting that we have, it'll be, you know, one here and then we'll go to text dot, which is kind of more south. They have an out, uh, outstanding facility there as well. So if you if you haven't been, these are amazing meetings at these facilities. You have to come check them out in person. I think you're going to really enjoy them. So um, let's see if I can make this work again. Here we go. So we have a we have a full agenda today. I want to let you know that uh, we got a little door prize. So if you haven't signed in, please do so. We're going to call off that list at the very end, and we got a. A little something for you if you're here in person. If you're if virtual, I apologize, but you uh, are not eligible for the prize that you have to be here to collect. So maybe it, maybe we'll keep ramping it up. Maybe put an iPod or something. Do they have iPods anymore? Uh, on the list next time. Um, we're going to talk about some uh, the, the new state plane coordinate. Uh, that's kind of been a big deal. Some of you all have heard about that. Uh, state plane uh, 2022 is kind of coming around. I think it's important we understand what that means for us. Uh, we're going to talk about the Tenris bulk downloader. So people who use our data, if you need to pull a lot of files at one time, we're going to give a little demonstration of how to do that. Um, so we're excited about that talk about some of our strat map project updates and then I want to do a open roll call where this is where we kind of go around the room and find out what people are doing uh, those of you that are virtual um, I'm some of the major agencies I'll, I'll call on see if there's anybody here that can talk about that 
Um, and then if there's anything you want to say, it can be a job posting you have or a need you might have, um, feel free to raise your hand we'll, uh, virtually and we'll call on you and then you can speak. Uh, then we have a special presentation from Cam Draper at Data Axel. Um, they have an amazing address type database. Uh, I, I hate to say it's just address type. It's there's a lot that goes on with these with these with this data set, and it, you can almost learn anything and get any type of information from a, an address point that you could ever want. And um, it's it's amazing. So Cam's going to talk a little bit about uh, what they have in store, and there's some state agencies that are using that. We just wanted to make other people aware that that data does exist, and then we'll do a wrap up um, at the very end. So anyway, stay tuned. So since we last met, uh, a couple of things have happened. We had an ATX GIS day here at ACC Highland Campus. That was amazing. Um, it was really amazing to see this, the you know students who are walking around who are trying to f kind of find their way as it relates to they're going through school they want to learn what uh, the professionals are doing, and there were booths set up. They went around talking to uh, other companies and agencies who have GIS shops and uh, you know what it is they need to learn or what they they need to know. There were presentations that we talked to, you know, that we had that uh, people came in and, and listened to, and it was it was very well done, and it was it was so much fun. So, uh, if I understand, Stephanie, these are going to be these are going to be annual. Um, so, next uh, ATX GIS day, we're going to do it again. I highly encourage y'all to attend or to be a part of it. Also, too, um, our own Felicia Retiz was honored um, at GIS day. Um, she was our GIS hero. And so you see some pictures over there, um, but that was just an, an amazing, amazing thing. You know, G, uh, uh, definitely Felicia has been the big, the face of Tenris. We've always said that um, she has uh, taken retirement and is uh, currently enjoying. I just texted her to see what she was doing. She's in California with her grandbabies, so um, she's doing extremely well. But that was uh, so well deserved, and that was so so much fun to. Uh, honor her with the GIS Hero Award. So that was that was fun. Um, also, too, um, I want to talk about broadband last here because I want Miguel to just say a couple of words. But um, we have a couple of job opportunities coming up. If anybody is interested in working for Tenris, stay tuned. Watch for our tweets at, at Tenris um, or look on our jobs page, um, the, web, the website up there. Note that and just keep keep watching and we'll keep announcing it as well. We also want to let you know that we're all doing the forum kickoff um, too. That's going to be, uh, you know, we're already actually started that. Uh, Christine has been working on that uh, diligently, so more is coming out sooner. We're actually we we got a really good plan on how we're going to be doing this, so more information is going to come out sooner than later. Uh, so just know that we're 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 working on that. And before I switch to the next slide, I'm going to see if Miguel, if you could come up and talk a little bit about what's going on with broadband mapping. Thank you. Who has heard about the broadband availability map? Okay, a few hands. <coughs> Who has heard about the Tenris address points? A few more hands, okay. So let's imagine every address in the state of Texas. Some addresses have houses, some addresses have buildings, right? Some addresses are vacant lots. So what they were trying to do over there is see every single location in Texas that is uh, broadband serviceable location. Doesn't mean that they have already uh, internet service, but that is serviceable in the future, right? What they're trying to do is, once we have the list of locations, figure out what kind of speed service they're getting. And for that, we work with the internet service providers, so not we, but the Texas Control of Public Affairs work with the internet service providers and with a company called UCLA to match those speeds and make the speed maps to see who is uh, eligible for funding to develop further the infrastructure and getting fast internet into the house. So they break it into three different tiers. The one is as no service. That means you have uh, 20 megabits per second or less. I think that's the number uh, or nothing at all. That means you are unserved. If you have between 20 and 100 megabits per second, that is underserved. And if you have 100 or more, that means you are served. So all those locations that are served are not eligible for funding. 
And the idea is that the state of Texas can ask the federal government for funding to improve the uh, internet infrastructure in the state so everybody can equally access uh, health services information services can access to renew their driver license online and things like that that we take as granted but not everybody has so that is the idea of it another part another part of it is the uh, federal Com uh, communications commissions i think fcc has a fabric of address points and sometimes we see that some of those address points are broadband serviceable locations and are not included in there so when that happens there's something called a challenge and that sounds like a wrestling or something but it's really just telling them you're missing a spot here you're missing a dot here people like you and me can say okay my house is not on your fabric uh, internet service providers can say, okay, all this uh, subdivision is not in your fabric. And people, uh, representatives of the state, like uh, the controller of public accounts, can do a batch a challenge saying, all these uh, 100,000 locations are not in that fabric. And then FCC reviews that and say, oh, yes, you're right, 80% of those that you gave me are not part of the fabric, and I'm going to improve them, and they can become eligible later on. Any questions on that? I think it's every everybody's on the clear. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Yeah, I think you're going to hear a lot more about that if you haven't already. And uh, the data the data are going to be just getting better as as we move forward. So uh, we also are planning to try to have the uh, comptroller come and talk a little bit more about that at a future meeting. Maybe give you some more details. So uh, thanks, Miguel. Uh, as I mentioned, the forum is going to be October 23rd through the 27th. We're still working out the details on exactly what days are going to are going to be on there. It'll be at our normal place at the JJ uh, Pickle Center, the Common Center uh, there north where we always had it. Uh, so again, yeah, keep 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 looking out for that. We're always interested in presentations and talks. And if you know of keynotes or uh, any really good speakers you think would be really good and dynamic for our event, I would love to hear from you. Feel free to send me an email on that because that's how I find, you know, a, a lot of folks are from you guys. So uh, definitely keep that in mind. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn this over to Miguel one more time to talk about uh, the basically the new geospatial standard that we have. I know this we've talked about this a little bit. There are some people coming maybe a little bit weirded out about what this might mean to your data. And so hopefully Miguel can clear some of that up. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Miguel. Thank you again. Okay, who here think that the earth is flat? <laughs> Any flat earthers over here? Okay, I need to see you two at the exit later on. Who here can agree with me that Texas is a big state? Okay. So can one projection fit it all? Yes, it can. Can one projection fit it all with low distortion? No, the right answer. Thank you. So uh, here you have some numbers about the total area and the width and the length of Texas, which is great. If you don't believe me, just start driving anywhere, south, north, east, and west, and you'll see it takes hours to get out of the state, right? Okay, so uh, a few years ago, like three or four already like in 20, 2018 the Conrad Blucher Institute of Surveying and Science in Texas A&M the Texas Department of Transportation and other uh, surveyors and uh, groups of surveyors started saying okay maybe we need uh, a standard that is better than the five standard uh, state plane zones that we have in Texas because if you're right on the edge of that county you have a lot of distortion because that's the, the step going into the next uh, state plane zone. So the five state plane zones were defined in 1983, I think. Yes, 1983. And they were just like that. That is a copy that I got from a piece that was still in paper. Anybody remembers paper? Yeah. yeah. So 1983, pretty much everything was still in paper. And that's when they came up with those songs. Okay, since 1983 to now, so you need to go forward 40 years, 
a lot of uh, science and surveying and uh, GPS technology has improved a lot. So now we can map with a better efficiency. And that was not displayed in those five state plan zones. If anybody is married to any of those state plan zones, they are not going away, you can still use them. But this, the, the new uh, state plan zones will give you more uh, flavors, more uh, uh, choices to choose from. This is a map that we have seen many times from the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife that defines the zones. In between the zones is, in the transition, is where you get the most distortion. And that is way, way more than 20 parts per million. So the five zones are traditionally north, north central, we live in central, then we have south central and south. So this is a early drawing of, uh, they were aiming for 40 or 50 state plan zones that will try to map the whole state. And the goal was to have uh, less than 20 parts per million of distortions in Texas uh, territory. So if into the Gulf of Mexico or into Mexico or Oklahoma or New Mexico gets more than that, it doesn't really matter because Texas was the main focus of this exercise. <laughs> Can you map all of them with the same flavor of projection? No, it's tough because you have some that are vertical, some that are horizontal, some that are diagonal. So for those uh, horizontal, they use Lambert conformal conics, similar to the previous five state plane zones that were much larger. For some of uh, the vertical ones, they use Mercator, and for some all of the diagonals, they use oblique Mercator, which is the most of them, like 31 out of the 50. And uh, this was just a preliminary design. The design keeps changing and changing. Uh, places like uh, here in the Davis Mountain, you see it's way more than pay, uh, 20 parts per million of distortion. So people will keep trying to fix that. But that's not it. If you buy now, you can get two for the price of one. No, I'm kidding. That's not it. That was not the end of the story because as we keep discussing this, we said, okay, what if the airport is right in the middle of two different projections? How are you going to manage that? What if the county is in the two middle projections? What if the city of Houston is in two different projections like there? I said, no, we, we, we want to try to keep the city in one projection, the airports for sure in one projection, and the counties for the most part, uh, the whole county in one projection. So the thing kept iterating and iterating, and we have like meetings every couple of weeks for three years, which are a lot of meetings, discussing that. Uh, in those meetings, we'll discuss the science. Okay, we have six possible designs for this projection, for one of the 50. Uh, and uh, in the one on the left, we get values of uh, 30, 31 parts per million. The one of the, of, of the right, we get a little bit less for the, uh, I think it's the Bolivar Peninsula and the, the pass over there. So we decided that the one on the right is better than the one on the left. And overall, it's better. So we go checking on it. So we have uh, like votes who think uh, the sign six is better than the sign one. And, we eventually decided for design six. So after years and years and that, a lot of Excel spreadsheets, a lot of graphics, trying to map the distortion overall in all of the 50 different uh, uh, low distortion projections for Texas, we came up with final designs and final definitions. These are the definitions for all of them. Do you need to memorize that? No, no you don't. Because the idea is that once those are uh, have the final approval from uh, NOAA and the uh, National Geodetic Survey, that TENRIS is going to be a repository for those definitions, and eventually uh, Global Mapper and ESRI and QGIS will start adopting all those 50 new definitions, but without losing your five already familiar uh, stand, uh, state planes that we already have. The final design looks something like this, rather than try to make a too general um, projection over there on the Davis Mountains, we, went, we have a very localized, and for the rest of the areas, we're going to keep using the five uh, state planes that we already have. All of them, for the, the great majority, is try to keep it here, 
in between plus minus 20 parts per million. So most of Texas is green. There are some yellows, yes, there are some reds, some blues. For, most, for the most part, that is the result of uh, three years of work of, I don't know, 25 or 30 people. People much smarter than me, people that know what they are doing, came up with those designs. Uh, and I think, uh, oh yes, that email. That email said, okay, uh, you have a, pre a preliminary approval of your state planning zones, but we want some minor tweaks and changes. And the NGS offer to make those minor tweaks and changes that will not affect the distortion in any way, but will make it better for the public, for us. And we jump at the opportunity and say, yes, please do it for us. And after they do it, it's going to be officially approved. So we are expecting by summer of this year, they will be officially approved. And I think that's it. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, people, we need to have a microphone rule. Um, so Miguel, can you talk a little bit about uh, what that meant for our control points when we went through this process? If control, if uh, you know, did this outline maybe uh, any discrepancies within our our control, our data control, and and what are we doing about that? Okay, can you hear me with this? So, uh, while we were discussing that areas of subsidence in the coastal zone of Texas, kind of out west of Houston, we were thinking, okay, what about the control point in those areas? Is that still valid? And uh, it was still valid, it was still official, but it, the need to reposition those survey uh, control points was uh, apparent. So people at the Conrad Blucher Institute I started resurveying those monuments and uh, for two or three days. So all the variability goes away after eight hours. So for two or three days, they will re reposition them and send corrections to the NGS saying, okay, this point, the new uh, current position is in reality, like one feet lower and a few inches to the right and a few inches to the south. That way, people doing surveying can use the new uh, low distortion projections with the new control points to reference all the properties and all the systems and all the geology and all the studies that can be done with uh, low distortion projections. Hey, we have a question from Bruno Blanco. It's when are these new state plane projections expected to go live and be adopted by ESRI? I don't know about uh, ESRI, uh, but I, I know that uh, the NGS will probably get them approved by the summer of this year, 2023. And after that, I think it will come back in the next iteration of the software, right? It will be fixed in the next version. Yeah, my my understanding is, and if ESRI's on, um, they can correct me or, or weigh in, but my understanding is, is that they're waiting for these things to be finalized so they can finish their, you know, developing the conversion tools um, that will allow you to convert, you know, back and forth from the different projections. So, um, and I believe they've already are way down that path. They're just waiting for final uh, approval. So hopefully soon. Any questions from the audience? Any more questions on line? Okay, thank you, Miguel, appreciate it. Um, one thing I, would, I did wanna bring up on this is uh, when this first started, I guess several years ago, that was one of the concerns we had was a lot of these um, areas were computer defined uh, and not necessarily people defined. And uh, one thing Miguel had to go do is kind of look at all the areas to make sure they weren't crossing airports or certain areas that we definitely did not want those to be cut between uh, different pr projection uh, areas. So um, I think we did, a, you know, they, they understood that and we provided them a, a, a list of things we needed to have changed and uh, they took those into account. So we were very, very happy we got to do that. So, okay, we'll move on if nobody else has any questions. All right. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Repka, our senior developer, to talk a little bit about our bulk downloader. Um, so Chris. Go. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. So I'm Chris Rook. Just going to talk to you about the bulk downloader that we recently developed. Um, 
a second version of. Um, has anybody used the bulk downloader before? Okay, so a few over here <laughs> internally. Uh, has anybody used data.tinnerus.org before? Okay, lots more. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that you might have come across on data.tinnerus.org is you might want to download a lot of data all at once. Um, but right now they're chunked up by, you know, these areas, so all of the counties. Um, but the bulk downloader basically enables you to download all of this data in one go. Um, and we can open it up right here. So this is the bulk downloader. And what we're going to need to do in order to get all of these areas, all the resources for this collection, is copy the ID of the collection right here. Eventually, uh, within the next few weeks, this will be up in the description here, so it's easier to grab. Um, but we're just going to copy that. Paste it in here. And then for this one, it's address points. So we're going to select address points, and we're going to get the data. We have to select a directory to download in. So I'm selecting our downloads directory. Yeah, you'll take this collection ID here from data.tinnerus.org, um, and you will paste it. right in this box right here. Um, and then after that, you can select browse and select the folder that you want your data to be downloaded into. You can select the category of the resource type that you want to download. So in this case, we're downloading the address point data collection. We want to select address points and then we'll click get data and you'll get some live feedback down here for each resource that's being downloaded from that collection. Um, so that's that's about it for the data bulk downloader. Um, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Very sorry for the technical difficulties, um, but sometimes these things happen. So thank you. Yeah, and uh, I, Chris had mentioned too that there is there there isn't a uh, a cap on what you can download from a from the bulk downloader. So, not not that I'm encouraging everybody to just download the state at one time or anything like that. But, um, but yeah, as far as like counties worth of information or so, that this is an extremely valuable tool. So, uh, any questions here in the audience for Chris? Anybody online? All right. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll take that. All right. And next, I believe we have Lauren Kirk to talk a little bit about what's going on on the StratMap side. Okay, cool. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Kirk. I'm the Geographic Data Coordinator at Tenris. Thanks for coming today. I'm gonna to talk to you guys, give a couple project updates on some of the stuff that our StratMap program is working on. Um, so I'll start with the Texas Imagery Service first. If you're not uh, familiar with it, the Texas Imagery Service is our subscription-based orthoimagery program. It's open to state and local government entities. Um, we partner with AppGeo and Hexagon to fly the imagery. It is six inch natural color. Um, and we aim to do full statewide collects every other year at this point. So currently our most up-to-date statewide collection is the 2020, 2021, um, which is live in that service. And then in the summer of 2022, um, AppGeo and Hexagon flew the 14, for, flew 20, blah, sorry. <laughs> Blue updates on 14 major urban areas, as you can see here in green. Um, and then currently, just started at the very end of November, beginning of December of 2022, we are flying the next full statewide collect for 22 and 23. Um, we anticipate the new collect to become available at the end of this summer. So really exciting about that. Um, what do I have next? Okay. Cool, this is the flight status update that I just got this week from our partners at AppGeo. Um, like I said, the flights are pretty recent. So right now they're really focusing up in the Panhandle and the North Central Texas area. I'm happy to answer questions, you know, 
in the future if you have any about you know status updates and such um, but i get these directly from our crew at appgeo um, this is a graphic many of you have probably seen before. Like I mentioned, we're a subscription. The Texas Imagery Service at least is a subscription-based orthoimagery program. So there are uh, tiers, uh, cost tiers associated with it. Um, this information and a lot more, including an FAQ, a live up-to-date status map on the Texas Imagery Service, and a whole lot more can be found on the Texas Imagery Service project page on the Tenris website. If you haven't been there yet, I highly recommend you check it out. There's a lot of good information there. Um, in addition to that, if you are new to the Texas Imagery Service program, you want to learn more about it, you want to test it out, you can request a free trial, two-week free trial, uh, through the project page on our website. Um, so again, please, please submit requests. <laughs> I want people to try this imagery. It's really, really good quality imagery. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I have on Texas Imagery Service. Um, then going on to 2023 land parcel and address points, um, that kicked off this week. So don't have any data in yet, but hopefully in the next month, month and a half, that will be slowly trickling in. Again, that should be available on the Tinder's Data Hub July of 2023. And I encourage you guys to visit the Data Hub to check out um, past year's land parcels and address points um, collections that we have accrued. Um, Chris showed uh, the opportunity to bulk download those, which are really helpful. And then lastly, I have a, just a very brief update on the NOAA and Tenris land cover acquisition. Um, it will be public domain on the Data Hub. It's expected sometime late summer 2023 one meter resolution of the Houston Galveston region, which is about 13 county area, 25 vegetation classes. We're really super excited about that. I don't think this is the first veg uh, land cover rather data set we've had in a very, very long time. Um, so yeah, that concludes my updates for StratMap. If anyone has any questions online in person, let me know. Nope, cool. Then I will turn it over to Joey to give a, oh, so yeah, real quick, Lauren, um, is it? Uh, are we expecting that we're going to be leaf off for the for the foreseeable future when it comes to every yes. other year? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to be collecting in the fall and yeah, the fall winter leaf off time period, whereas NAPE kind of is like that other substitute right. imagery program that collects during the summer, spring, summertime. Okay. Good. Yep. We just hope uh, that we get some cold weather to keep the leaves off the yep. trees. Otherwise, we'll be we'll be blooming in February. Right. Uh, we have a question from Sally Hall. Uh, she says, will the land cover be expected beyond Houston Galveston? At this time, I do not believe so. I mean, 13 county area around the Houston Galveston area, but no, at this point it's it's more kind of like a pilot of sorts. Um, and then we will want to expand upon that to eventually do the whole state. Yeah, yes, but we are actively looking for partners on yes. that. So if you are interested Partner in that land us. cover data set, please let Lauren or myself know. Yes, please. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, Lauren. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Joey Thomas. I'm the StratMap manager. Um, and I'm just going to be talking a little bit about the live sessions that are ongoing in the state. So we have some great new updates. Um, we are currently in the process of acquiring the El Paso region and the upper Clear Fork Brazos Huck areas, um, which are these blue areas here. Um, that is going to be at our standard specification, the four points per square 10 centimeter. And then the additional classifications of buildings, vegetations, and culverts. Um, we are also informed that the USGS is doing a collection down in the Rio Grande Valley down in South Texas there in that green area. Um, and we were told that it is a QL1 collection and it will include buildings and vegetation classifications as well, um, which is great news um, that the area definitely needs some more data. Um, and then we were all selected for award for a 3DEP um, a grant program um, for those orange areas there. And that's gonna be our target for this upcoming winter, the 2024 or 2023, 2024 um, leaf off period. So a lot of LIDAR being acquired this year um, and planned for next year. Um, and we're also looking for anybody else that would like to acquire data in the state and we can help you partner up and um, give you some great accounts through the IR uh, contracts.
Any questions about the LIDAR acquisitions before I move on? Okay, cool. Um, we're also in the process of doing our classification initiative with the USGS LIDAR data. Um, we just recently initiated that project for uh, the hurricane, the 2019 hurricane USGS data and the Dallas Pecos, a uh, big portion of that, um, is where we're adding in low vegetation, medium vegetation, high vegetation buildings and culverts to those data sets. Um, and we expect those to be wrapped up and available on data.tenorus.org in the summer, fall of the 20, of later this year. Uh, we're also doing some bathymetry initiatives. Um, this year, we, we plan to continue those efforts that we initiated last year and the year before. Um, we're currently working to finalize the statements of work and the priority areas. Um, right now, we're looking uh, mostly around the Nueces Bay and then portions of the Texas Upper Coast region. Um, these are areas that were identified by the Texas Integrated Flooding Framework Workshop, where we got input from a lot of the stakeholders in the state and identified where along the coast those areas that we need to acquire data are. Um, and so those are the areas we'll be targeting this summer and into the future with our bathymetry acquisitions. Um, we expect that to hopefully initiate in the late spring. Um, so keep an ear out for those. Um, we also have good news. The 2021 Laguna Madre bathymetry collection that we did uh, was accepted by NOAA into their Blue Topo program, and it was added to their navigational charts. Um, so we're glad that data we acquired can be utilized by the feds and enhance the mapping programs um, throughout the industries. Always glad to see our data getting used. And I think that's it for me. And I'll pass it off to Aaron to speak a little bit about our initi initiatives in the uh, RDC. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Pierce. I'm the GIS specialist managing the uh, Research and Distribution Center, RDC of Tenris. Um, I just have a quick little update regarding our georeferencing projects. Um, we have scanned all of our imagery unique to Tenris, and we're looking to uh, start a georeferencing project to get that uh, get that going next. Um, we're looking to start that either in the late spring or early summer of this year, so that'll be coming up uh, pretty quickly. Um, and uh, as I've talked about before, that's going to be uh, imagery that is more urban or metro areas um, along the state, um, and just kind of a collection that's unique to Tenris. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, if you have any questions in the audience, uh, uh, feel free to ask, or if we have any questions, yeah. How will you be able to do that? Yeah, so that's actually something that we are uh, still wanting to work out with whatever vendor that we uh, decide to, to go with for the project. We've gone through a few testing ideas of different ways to bulk georeference, um, and we're still kind of settling on a, a good route to, to go in regards to this project. Correct, yes. Yeah, any other questions? Cool, then I think, uh, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we're, you know, really excited about is 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 having this archive uh, in place is something I think we've been really proud of. But you know, when it's locked up in the basement, nobody can really use it. And the fact that it was a working archive, a lot of the a lot of the photos were getting damaged. Um, all of those have been scanned, and so you know, our hope and our goal would be is to create layers out of this, as you see on the screen here. Um, to make this some sort of seamless class of historical data that you can use within your GIS system. So we're really looking forward to doing this that sort of uh, uh, referencing, but at the same time, too, we're also looking at some of the new technologies, hopefully, that will come out of this um, as, a, as a pilot where maybe we can use some sort of artificial intelligence to auto-reference auto things uh, against each other. Um, so we're looking into all different types of ways to try to do this to get the data out there as quick as we can to y'all. Um, so we'll definitely be keeping you posted on what we learn um, through this exercise. So uh, thanks, Aaron. Okay, um, I think now we go to roll call, which is I think my favorite part of, of this. 
Uh, again, I mentioned this is a community meeting and uh, we've given you our updates and now we hope to hear your updates. Um, so I just you know, wanna go down the list a little bit and see if there's uh, anybody, at least in the audience that might want to give us their updates. Um, and then we'll go to the, to the, to the online folks. Um, but Scott, are you willing to give us your update? Let me hand you a microphone though. Oh, there we go. Those prizes for going first. <laughs> hey, everybody. Scott Friedman here with the General Land Office. I'm the dir uh, director of the geospatial team there. Um, and uh, I'll just kind of give you a few highlights of what some things that we're working on. You may be aware that we just had a, a statewide election. And so our, our office has a brand new land commissioner, the first female land commissioner in mm -hmm. the history of the land office, the oldest state agency. Um, so that's pretty momentous. Um, and as part of that, obviously, the uh, website went through a, a bunch of recent changes, rebranding or you know changing uh, changing out the names of the commissioner on a lot of pages. And so the geospatial team was was part of that on the GIS pages. Um, in addition, we have uh, if you if you know the, the land office is the kind of the keeper of Texas history, and we have a map store. I don't know if anybody's visited the GLO map store, but um, it's been going through a revamp recently, and the uh, the new and improved map store is coming up any day now. I've seen a, a preview of it in an internal release, and we've also been chomping at the bit for that because. Um, our team, the geospatial team, and a lot of our interns um, have been working on a bunch of new story maps for that uh, under the, the project called Texas Hidden History. And so a lot of story maps um, will be released together with the new map store, um, highlighting really interesting um, stories of Texas history presented in a, in a new and dynamic way. Um, a lot for for educators and and school children in the state, but also for the public. Um, we're working on a a new mapping viewer called the Coastal Resources Mapping Viewer (CRM Viewer). Um, I, I don't know if you're aware of resource management codes, but resource management codes or RMCs are codes assigned to state-owned submerged lands that we manage. So all of the waters in the in the Gulf of Mexico and the bays, and then coastal lakes and rivers. Um, can't are, are are under the responsibility and management of the land office and we lease those tracks it's divided up into a grid and we lease those tracks for energy exploration and uh that revenue goes for to the permanent school fund well so rmcs are guidelines to companies um of what uh might be present in those tracks whether it's cultural resources or biological resources and um those are those are now that used to be experts gathering around maps and assigning those codes. Where where are the piping plovers? Where are uh, pipelines, etc.? Uh, where where should there be dredging restrictions? Um, now it's all data driven, and so those those data sets. We're working on an RMC data hub where those those data sets that drive those codes uh, will be available for download, and it's it's in tandem with that coastal resource management viewer. Um, we're also working on symbolizing one foot contours from the UT Bureau of Economic Geology shoreline LIDAR surveys. So that's, those are gonna be used in the CRM viewer for coastal planners and project managers to see the, the shoreline and dune system morphological changes over time, particularly when there are major storms, for example, Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Um, and then with generous funding and support, um, uh, strap map funding through Tenris and the GIO, we are building a new permanent school fund uh, land uh, uh, layer based on the Railroad Commission. Thank you to the Railroad Commission for their publicly available land grid. Um, and we're about 60% done with our target deliverable for this year and about 45% done overall with the PSF tracks, the permanent school fund lands. After that, there'll be a another five or seven year push to do the rest of the state. I don't know if you know, but uh, PSF lands, permanent school fund lands are about 13 to 14 million acres in the state. Um, and that's where a lot of the revenue comes from for, for, the, for public schools in Texas. We are waiting, another initiative is, we're waiting for a really large data delivery from two different contractors. 
um, updated biological data, and uh, that, that includes fish, invertebrates, terrestrial mammals, et cetera, and the updated environmental sensitivity index, or ESI shoreline. Um, a lot of folks use that shoreline, those shoreline classifications, particularly for, for things like oil spill response, uh, to see where the, the critical um, uh, resources are to protect when there's a spill. Uh, so once completed, we're going to have a major push to, you know, for a major update of the um, oil spill toolkit, which are used by Texas responders and as well as Gulf Gulf wide uh, when there are oil spills. And the last thing I'll mention is our internship program. I mentioned some interns are here. Um, we recruit interns once a year for the for the next entire school year. So we're about to do that. Um, probably we'll release our call for applications next month. And so if anybody is interested in applying, uh, please check our webpage at glo.texas.gov slash GIS. Um, or if you know students that might be interested in applying, um, and we'll, we'll start recruiting over the next few months for uh, starting in September of this coming year. Thanks. Great, Scott, thank you. Any questions for GLO? Okay, hey, hang on to that because I'm about to call on Travis right behind you. Travis from uh, TextDot, I think can provide a few updates. Yeah, hey everyone. My name is Travis Scruggs. I'm here to represent TextDot. And um, I don't have quite as lengthy a, a list of topics as Scott did, but <laughs> there are some good ones. Um, so hopefully, uh, you all have taken a, a, a glance at our webpage. We finally, after years of effort, <laughs> convinced IT to give us a maps and data tab on our home on the text.homepage. homepage. It's right right there, front and center. So now you can have direct access to, to all the all the great work and uh, and and data that we've you know spent decades producing in some cases. Um, so please check that out. Uh, we also, speaking of the election that just happened, we now have updates to our legislative maps and data uh, available on that maps and data tab. So if you want the most recent uh, political boundary layer with all the updated names of elected representatives for uh, state, you know, Texas, Senate and House, and then also U.S. House, um, all that data is available on our website. Um, it just, it's, it's, it's pipe and fresh, just got updated. Um, earlier this week. We also uh, want to mention the electric vehicle infrastructure plan. Uh, you can find that on the website if you dig a little bit, but it's easier, honestly, if you just Google text.ev plan. Uh, this plan has now been approved and uh, is moving forward. Text.ev is in charge of a very large sum of money that I cannot remember the exact sum of, um, but we are deploying a um, a very large number of uh, electric vehicle charging stations across the state. And the EV plan details the uh, process by which those funds are going to be used to build those charging stations and how they will be distributed across the state to try and equitably provide access to EVs, uh, both in rural, especially in rural areas, to encourage adoption in areas where uh, that infrastructure was not uh, previously available. So that's really exciting. Um, we also, uh, just on that same note, it's also really exciting to see, um, kind of off topic a little bit, but ERCOT um, has a website where you can check out uh, daily production across the state for like how much energy is being produced across the state, how much is being consumed. And it's just really encouraging to see that something like 64% of the energy being generated on average in the last month or so is all renewable in the state. So. Things are, I think, trending in the right direction. Um, so check out that that EV plan. It's a, I think it's a really encouraging read uh, and where our state is kind of headed in the future, in the not too distant future. Uh, TxDOT is also, um, I mentioned this last community meeting, but we are spinning up a UAS program, so a drone program. Uh, we're still in the testing and acquisi acquisition phase. Um, can't give a whole lot of de details about it because, of course, you know, acquisitions, but uh, it's an exciting step for TxDOT. There are other uh, DOTs that have been doing this for a couple of years now. We're finally taking the steps to try and catch up. And I think once things get ramped up, um, it should be a pretty significant change in, in how we do our business. 
I'm excited, Scott. We, we still need to sit down and talk um, about how GLO is doing your drone drone work, but um, it's a good reminder for me to reach out to you after the meeting. <laughs> Uh, also, um, we are going to, like my my branch, the mapping branch inside TPP and TxDOT is going to have uh, an intern as well in the summer. So um, by the time we have our next meeting, um, and maybe even before, uh, I should be able to provide an update on that and when to look out for uh, an opening. And that's it. Thank you. Travis, uh, thank you. R real quick question for you: do, Are you do you know if um, if uh, if TechDot is received or is receiving any infrastructure fund money that's that's recently been available? I've been hearing a lot about other states who are receiving from this infrastructure bill that's been passed oh, yeah, uh, right. relating to EV and stuff like that. Are we is Texas taking advantage of any of that? Well, if you mean specifically for EV stuff, is uh, that, is that yeah. the question? It, it, yeah, primarily for EV, that's what brought it up in my head because I know that's kind of one of the big things. But any other things transportation related that might uh, be yeah, I mean, I think down the um, pike. So TPP, the division that I'm in, the transportation planning and programming, not computer programming, confusingly, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. project programming, uh, we're responsible for helping allocate. I think this year, 87 billion dollars worth of uh, infrastructure spending so um and a small portion of that will be related to now i i, I should be careful quoting a number that i'm not 100 percent sure on but i believe it's 87 billion dollars um but yes a small portion of that is going to be related to ev uh charging stations and infrastructure across the state and i think if you check out check out the plan um one of the first round efforts is is putting a at least one bank of charging stations um, in every county in the state. So that means that even in, in super rural, small population counties, uh, there's still going to be infrastructure available for, for people to charge their electric vehicles. So, and, and that's going to be, you'll see in the plan, there's maps uh, as well. You can, you can see that a lot of those uh, charging stations are going to be distributed across uh, major uh, transportation corridors. So, you know, if you are traveling across the state, you should always be able to find in the near future a, a charging station. Excellent. Any questions for Travis? Anything online? For the charging stations? Uh, are you talking about start of construction, completion, all the above? Um, I'd have to I'd have to refer back to the plan on the exact dates. Um, the plan has I think it got approved uh, officially like two weeks ago so it, it's still in a lot of you know it's in the early stages right um the charging stations are going to be built by third parties so you know, we provide uh some funding and then the third parties will go out and build the stations um and it'll be there was talk about trying to get you know TechDOT to incentivize use of the new uh open sourced standard the tesla standard uh, charging you know, they have a Tesla has their proprietary uh, charging port and and uh, cable, but they just open sourced it. So now anyone can anyone can use it, um, and you can you can charge up to a megawatt or something through it. It's it's crazy. So uh, I don't think we're there yet, but hopefully that'll that might roll out in maybe a second phase or something. But yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a while. It takes a while to to build those stations. I would not expect uh, statewide coverage for you know, a year or two. Any other questions? But do check out the plan. It's a good read. Yep. Thank you, Travis. Okay. Uh, looking for anybody from TCEQ, anybody in the room or anybody online wants to give a update maybe from a TCEQ perspective? Don't see anybody here. Any hands raised, Joey? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. if you have any uh, updates on the roll call, if you're online, please raise your hand and we can unmute you. Okay. Uh, Railroad Commission, yes, sir. Thanks, Richard. Hey, uh, 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jared Ware. I'm uh, with the Railroad Commission. I'm the Director of Critical Infrastructure Division. And uh, kind of our biggest project this past year is building what's known as the SB3 map. So the uh, um, map that tracks the electrical infrastructure for the state of Texas. And so uh, it took us about a year. We uh, had the first iteration in April, um, updated it in September. And what we're doing now is in our filing system, which we have the next filing starting in February, is uh, we got a whole new project. And so what we kind of initially did was we got information from the industry, put the map together, and then figured out where that critical infrastructure was at. Now we're actually out conducting inspections. So uh, we built our inspection universe from that initial map. And now we're, we have a whole new project where we're actually gonna automate the system that goes along with the compliance and enforcement actions for the filings. So we'll, we'll kind of automatically populate that map and then have a kind of a real time understanding of where all the critical infrastructure is at. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, another initiative that we have going on, it's very similar to uh, kind of something we had before was um, we have an online um, portal where you can see where all the um, well plugging activities occurring across Texas. And so with the, the federal funding that we received this year, we have uh, several million dollars worth of uh, plugging activities going on across the state. So you can see the state funded side of it as well as the federal side of it as well. So we're pretty excited about that. It's a really large environmental project and, and we're really happy with where that's at and where it's going. And then we're also having other states kind of replicate what we've done here in Texas over the last couple of years. So kind of cool thing also is we're the only ones that regulate the natural gas industry for the electrical supply chain and that critical infrastructure. So uh, we've had um, some interest in that from uh, Louisiana. I got a call from Nigeria on that too, because they're starting their regulatory processes. So I, I would say here in Texas, we're doing some really neat things. We're innovating across all of our agencies and we work together with Public Utility Commission on this map. So um, other opportunities we have um so i stood up uh infrastructure operations section with data analysts and so just hired a new manager and um she's looking for really good data analysts with gis background python programming and some power bi so we have three uh data analyst positions kind of entry level and then we have a senior level one that will be opening up here pretty soon because um one of my data analysts she she moved back to india and she resigned today. So really senior position coming up if you're a data analyst. So we're always looking for folks with that ACC GIS background. So it's a great program here. And since my taxpayer dollars fund it too, I'm more than willing to hire you. So look us up. Excellent. Excellent. Hey, real quick question. You guys have a portal, right? Where we can, where we can actually download your information or use it or whatever. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we have the um, it's called the RSC uh, Public GIS Viewer. So there's there's information that's available for download. We're also using the Texas Open Data Portal for some of our reports, and so that that continues to be updated. And so um, part of uh, the idea is uh, our, our executive director is really big on transparency, and so all the information that we have GIS wise is downloadable as we create it. We're also working a little bit on the critical infrastructure side. Uh, unfortunately, the map is a secure map so you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement to actually be able to view it but we're also understanding that with our critical infrastructure inspection system there's some critical infrastructure that eventually will be downloadable because that just goes into some of the items that we all use so we're, we're working on that right now through some of our memorandum agreement and our attorneys but hopefully in the future we'll have that available to everyone as well so That's more to follow perfect because railroad commission data always comes up people are always asking about you know ha be, having access to it and so forth so uh if uh, anybody is interested go check out that portal i think it's i think you're gonna get some good stuff out of it so yeah one thing we learned so uh, on the uh critical infrastructure side so uh we we didn't have some uh, a lot of difficulties on the feature data, but with the attributes, what we started finding out is, wow, there are a lot of things people are interested in, particularly the legislature. So we're, I, I would say we're enriching that information. And so that's just another initiative I just thought about, but it's just, there's so much more information that's associated with that icon on the screen and that feature data that a lot of attributes. So we've, we're kind of connecting our databases and it's kind of a refresh. So we're pretty excited about that on the uh, GIS IT side as well. Yeah, perfect. We'll definitely keep us posted in the future, too, of, of anything new going on. So thank you very much. Miguel, could you take his mic? I have a question. Oh, yes. Uh, the data was available on the, was that Texas Open Data Portal, or, or did you have your own open data portal? It's both. So on the uh, RRC, I'm sorry. Yeah, on the RRC website, it's downloadable. So pretty much for oil, gas, and the pipeline data is on the viewer. We also post information on the Texas Open Data Portal. As awesome. Well. Thank you very much. Yeah. So does TCEQ. I used to work there, so yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll speak a little bit for some of the initiatives we had there. Yeah. Any questions for anybody online? From anybody online? 
Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, also looking for anybody at uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, anybody online for that? We do have some people who are who have their hand up. Uh, Genera M. Navarra. You need to unmute yourself and then you can speak. Oh, nope. They nope. put their hand down. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. I actually got a couple of updates that uh, uh, Jeremy actually sent me. So I'm going to go ahead and, and just read through those real quick. But uh, if you did not know that the Texas Parks and Wildlife turns 100 this year. So uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big deal. And they've, um, the, the state parks board was actually uh, founded in 1923. And so they developed a website called texasstateparks.org slash 100 years to commemorate uh, their 100 years. So my understanding is that uh, it's a really good kind of blast through the past um, of the parks and wildlife. So check that out for sure. Um, also, uh, TPWD biologist and natural resource specialists continue to use mobile GIS applications primarily in the field uh, across the state for their work using ArcGIS online platform as a primary data hub. So um, obviously we've talked, talked about that before, but this is something that they've really been increasing there at, at, at parks. Also, they've started to migrate internal processes only or internal projects only from AGO platform to recently deployed ArcGIS Enterprise Portal using some of the best management practices developed in-house in uh, to best serve TPWD uh, now and moving forward uh, using all this new to them technology. They're going to also be working toward uh, expanding that uh, technology out to, to their more external stuff as well. So uh, still working through that, and I know they've been working on that for some time, so this is actually a really big uh, step for them. So um, hopefully we can get Jeremy here at the next quarterly, maybe to give us a little bit more of an update on what that portal might look like. Uh, so I would say if you have any questions, but I could not answer them if you did. So, um, so we'll move past, unless there's anybody else online that has a question or a thought. Okay, I've got one more. I just want to check on CSEC. Is anybody from CSEC here or online? Okay. Joey, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, we have Jannie Fung. Let's see. All right, Jannie, you're unmuted. Go ahead. You all hear me? Yes. Okay, so hi everybody. I'm uh, representing the city of Austin Enterprise Geospatial Data Group. Um, so my, my group comprises of mainly base mapping. My sister group uh, provides the enterprise applications. And then uh, we also provide the addressing for Travis County. And so uh, I just wanted to provide an update on um, on our website, we do provide, I'm gonna post it in chat, but we provided a, um, we developed a chat bot on our website to kind of help people navigate questions uh, in relation to uh, needing addresses and mapping questions uh, is kind of thrown in there um, on occasion. And so I just wanted to provide that link um, if y'all wanted to, if y'all need any type of assistance regarding that, we have that additional tool that we developed uh, recently. And then I'm also going to provide a link to our GIS map uh, page. And then I'm sure everybody is aware of the open data portal. And so I'm just going to post those three links uh, if y'all wanted to check those out. If y'all needed any type of data or um, information on applications that we provide, and that's that, all I got. That would be great. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, those links, by the way, um, we will post in our in our notes as well for you, uh, you guys that are here in the room. Uh, we'll get those posted and sent out. Um, so excellent. I know uh, TWDB is also on Taylor. Uh, sh uh, has a really, really fascinating and awesome update. So Taylor, if you are on. 
Taylor, go ahead and unmute yourself. Don't be shy. Oh, Taylor, we still can't hear you if you are speaking. I know she does because we chatted about this before the. No one, Taylor? Okay. So uh, uh, essentially, Texas Water Development Board is uh, developing a water data hub. Um, basically, it's kind of all things water. It's like it's the Internet of Things, but we're calling it Internet of Water. Um, and that's being developed uh, through a partnership of the Internet of Water .org. Uh, Oh, are you there, Taylor? I'm here. Yeah, it wasn't letting me unmute. Sorry about that. Go for it. Um, not to interrupt you, but yeah, um, we've been building a water data hub for Texas. Teneris has been developing it and um, we spent a really long time doing um, an inclusive human centered design approach to really make sure that we were listening to stakeholders and building a system that was intuitive and meeting their needs. So after, gosh, almost two years of work, we will be at the Water for Texas conference in the Teneris Interactive space with them demoing it. So if you're there, please stop by. Um, but essentially the you know, goal of the hub is really to have an intuitive system so you can search, index, document, and access all different kinds of water data across the state. Um, this is really a cooperative effort, so we are not storing or maintaining the data. We are providing standard documentation through metadata and data dictionaries with these data sets because we know that makes um, the data powerful and our goal is really fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. And so um, we are launching our beta version of the hub next month, so be on the lookout if you're on any of the TWDB emails you will get lots of notifications about it um, but we will have all kinds of D, G, um, data sets including lots of GIS resources um, related to water as well as uh, resources that are you know somewhat related to water like boundaries or soil and climatic data hazards so we'll have a mix of all kinds of stuff um, we are releasing it in a beta version because we are very driven by user feedback so once it's out, if you have time, please poke around. We'll have a survey, so we'd love to hear, you know, what you think, what you'd like to see, and then also note that we are continuing to grow our catalog, so we're kind of purposely putting it out there in a beta state to make sure, you know, we're meeting everyone's needs and so people can see the usefulness of standard documentation and we can kind of continue to build those partnerships and grow our catalog. So with that being said, um, if you have any kind of data that's related to water, I know I've spoken with several people that I'm sure are in this meeting, but we would love to include it. So in the meeting notes, Richard, um, let's include the data. It's datahub at twdb.texas.gov. But please reach out. We'd be happy to start working with you. And again, look out in a couple of weeks for the URL. That's uh, that's actually extremely exciting, uh, and Taylor, and amazed with all the work that's been going on. This has been one of a project that the board's been working on uh, that's been professionally designed up front. Uh, it's uh, gone through it, its paces and its steps, and it looks marvelous. And she's Taylor's done an uh, amazing job getting all the data in there. I also wanted to acknowledge GLO and Railroad Commission I'm sorry, GLO and Parks, who have helped us get some of their data in there as as uh, for use in the pilot. Um, but again, it's really critical. If you guys have some good water data uh, that's of of that you think so value and that people are asking for from you, please contact us to get it into the system. Um, I think it would be extremely beneficial for the state and others who really really rely on your data. So Taylor, I uh, appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I think that you have anybody else on? All right. Well, then um, anybody else in here? Anybody else want to say anything? I didn't call on you, but if you have anything you want to bring up, raise your hand. 
Yes, uh, microphone over there. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Emily Faber. I work for the Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts. I'm the GIS team lead there. Can't really talk much about broadband since, you know, that's a different vendor. Lightbox is uh, specifically working on the GIS mapping portion of that project. But I just wanted to introduce myself. This is my first time attending the GIO meeting. I know I sent you an email, Richard. Yes. So I just really briefly wanted to introduce myself to everyone and I just hope to continue to attend all the meetings moving forward and see if CPA can contribute to any kind of discussion or contribution for, you know, all the rest of the uh, Texas state agencies. So. Absolutely welcome. Mm -hmm. Thanks Thank for being you. here. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right. Well, I think we're going to move into the data axle presentation. I wanted to introduce uh, Cam Draper from Data Axle. And uh, Cam has flown in this morning all the way from Nebraska, um, who, uh, my understanding, it was freezing cold and you got up at four in the morning to, to be here with us today. So we can't tell you how much we do appreciate that. And uh, anyway, he's got some some really, really amazing things that their products uh, can do that I think will be extremely beneficial uh, to your areas as it relates to to addressing and, 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 and other data. So, Cam, I'm going to let you come up and you take it away. Uh, thanks for having me. And I don't know, did we get Cam's presentation? I now that I'm just not thinking about that, did we? Yeah, um, Christine's got the Christine's got it. Excel docs, and then once okay. I'm done with those, I can show them the online. Okay. They were oh, they were shared. Where do I go for that? Is that that? Uh, what does that say? Yeah, we might need Joe to come do this so we don't jack it up. We'll end up on a different website. Yeah, we'll end I, up on totally something it. different. <laughs> okay, let's start with that one. Oh, this one. Perfect. And then, Let me just open all Yeah. Of well, yeah, as long as I can toggle. More than two, correct? But just those two for now, and then my last one will be the one that I can go ahead and put on the business one. Okay, cool. All right. All right. Uh, again, hey, my name is Cam Draper. Um, see some familiar faces out there. Uh, Richard, thanks for having me back. Um, with Data Axle, formerly Info USA, um, I've been with the company for 20 years. Um, I'm hanging on by a thread because I did get up pretty early. So if I uh, miss anything, just go ahead and shout out. Um, so Data Axle, formerly Info USA, we're a, a data compiler. Um, we've been doing it since 1972, and we have uh, we compile, maintain, and enhance a business and consumer database. Um, we are compiling this. It's an address slash demographic database. Um, we compile from hundreds of sources, including phone books, um, SEC filings, utility connects, uh, web mining, um, you, you name it. Uh, we do an NCOA every month, so if someone moves from point A to point B, we get that. And we update our database. Um, we're updating our database in real time, um, and it's at the tune of about 7% on a monthly basis. Um, on the business side or commercial or employer side, um, we're doing everything behind the address, obviously. So it's your company name, it's your address, it's your Latin long, it's your executive contact names with their title, ethnicity, gender, email address. We've got your uh, industry codes, uh, both SIC and NAICS codes. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that, it, it basically, it's a code that defines what type of business it is. Is it a restaurant? Is it a church? Is it a police department, gas station? Um, and a lot of GIS users like yourselves will use these codes to segment out different pieces of the database. Uh, we can tell you the number of lo uh, employees at a location. Uh, we can tell you the number of employees corporate-wide. 
So in our database, let's just say there's 100 Starbucks in Austin. We'll have 100 records for all 100 Starbucks, and we'll tell you the number of employees at each location, all this other demographic data. We can tell you how long they've been in business, their credit ratings, uh, the square footage of the building, the type of the location. We can tell you if it's a headquarter, um, a uh, single location, or a branch. Um, all in all, we've got about 150 data fields with our, our, our commercial database. And this is a layout. Um, obviously, in GIS world, we'll, we send it in an Excel or a, a CSV file. Um, and these are the fields that, again, some we've already mentioned, but your primary address, um, which is a mailing address. We, also, we actually have a secondary address as well, which is what we geocode to. That would be the physical location. Um, we'll provide additional information like your census track and block. We'll have company websites. Again, your, your industry codes. We'll have a SIC and NAICS codes. Sometimes businesses have multiple lines. Uh, we'll provide mul multiple codes. Uh, we have not only, again, your location employment size, but corporate size. Uh, we've got your location sales volume. Uh, let's see. We, uh, we assign IDs to every business record in our database. So if a company moves or if a company changes names, say it went from ABC Lawn Mowing Company into XYZ, that code goes with it. So as a, as a user, you can track where that company is moving or if their name has changed year after year. Um, let's see, move forward. Credit scores, population codes. We can tell you if it's a home-based business. So we're compiling that data as well. We can tell you if they own or lease the building. We can tell you their fleet size. That's about it on the commercial side. We also have a consumer side of our database. Again, everything behind the address. We can tell you their name. We can tell you their address, their lat long. We can tell you the home type. Is it multifamily? Is it single family? We can tell you if it's a house, an apartment, a condo, a trailer. Um, we can tell you the home value. We can tell you the home income. We can tell you the number of uh, occupants at an address. We can tell you the number of children at address. Uh, we can tell you if there's a veteran present, um, marital status, gender, um, ethnicity, uh, language spoken in the home, all these characteristics uh, behind the address. And actually, let me pull up the consumer layout. Population codes, again, number of adults and number of children in the home. Uh, we can tell you uh, the sales price of the home. We can tell you if there's a mortgage present, and how much is owed on a mortgage. Um, some of you are probably starting to get a little creeped out by some of the data we've got. Um, <laughs> let's see some other ideas. Uh, Occupation codes, uh, we've got it all. There are some data points that we don't provide on our on our standard uh, output that we can append, like email addresses. We've got cell phone numbers. Uh, for law enforcement, we have uh, items like social security numbers. We've got vehicle information, VIN numbers. We can tell you how many vehicles are at a home, what kind of vehicle, if it's uh, gas or electric. Um, we got all sorts of cool stuff. Again, with on the consumer side, we do assign an ID. So if someone moves from point A to point B, you can track them. Political affiliations, we've got lifestyle data that we compile from like credit card purchases, online purchases, warranty cards. So uh, if Richard's interested in golf, we may have that on his profile that he likes golf. Um, Got stuff like uh, high tech indicators, wealth finders, et cetera. Um, again, we update the database daily on a monthly basis. It's, a, it's about 7% of the database, and it could be adding a new business. It could be flagging a business is closed. Um, ever since COVID hit, uh, our closed business locations have become very popular um, for offices like economic development. They're trying to identify. Um, industries that were impacted by, by COVID.
Um, in regards to, uh, I, I'm in the government division. I've been in the government division since 2003 when I started. So I'm working with federal, state, county, and municipal agencies, um, and you name it, A to Z, they, they all, all have different use cases. Um, some of our bigger users, Department of Transportation, uh, Department of Revenues, Health, Environmental, um, 911 are all pretty big users, economic development, uh, et cetera. That's our raw data, and that's typically what GIS users do. We also have an online platform, and if you're interested, I'll give you a little peek. It's more of a, it's a better visual representation of the data. I'm gonna set this down. Can you, you can all still hear me? I'm sure. Any questions so far? Yeah, there are some questions. Uh, how do we access the data, and is it free? <laughs> um, to access it, you have to license it. <clears throat> What's that? Oh, uh, to access the data, you have to license it, and uh, it is priced. It's quantity based on pricing. Um, so, for instance, if you wanted to license a data set of all businesses in the state of Texas, there'd be a cost per record. Or maybe it's Travis County. You just wanted, we can cut, we can, we can build customized databases. Um, so if you just wanted a, a database of all businesses in Travis County, or you wanted a database of all churches in uh, the Houston Galveston area, 13 counties, we can, we can segment those, those uh, records out by industry type. If you want, if you had a project that was geared towards uh, low income, right, um, and you wanted to, you wanted to map out low income in the state of Texas, we could, we could, we could build a database of everyone that fit that criteria. So maybe any family household that's less than fifty thousand a year in income, we can, we can build those databases. But again, to answer your question, it's not free. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and you, it's, a, it's licensed, twelve months. There is another question. Uh, yeah. Where does the lat on for address points, or do you generate your own in-house? So that's a good question. I, I'm not sure who the provider is for our lat longs. I'd have to look into that and get back to you. Uh, what I can tell you is in our database, about 82% of our addresses is a parcel level geocode. Um, about 10% is a site level, and you all know these uh, definitions probably better than I do, but I believe sites right in the middle of the street, maybe 100 foot offset. And then the remaining 8% is going to be like a zip 2, zip 4, zip centroid. Um, the reason that's there is because of rural America. You know, when I, when I started with the company and we started geocoding our database, it was more like a 40% parcel level in our database, 30% uh, site, and then the rest for your zip. And that's you know you're out in the country, and it's it's uh, geocoded to a, a mailbox that's a mile down the road, or it's a PO box, and and we get more and more accurate every year. Probably five years ago is 70% parcel level. Now we're up to 82. Uh, what I can tell you is when you get into like city proper for Austin, I don't want to say 100%, upper 90% parcel level, and then the remaining is probably site. It's just that rural America where we're continuing to. Or more accurate. And then there's one more question. Sure. What do you do to keep the data secure from hackers? So that's probably an answer for our, or a question for our security department. <laughs> I, I can I can follow up with you on that as well. I'll just send you the. Yep. Yep. So I, I work with just government. So I'm working with all your federal, state, county, and municipal agencies. I do work with a lot of government contractors like engineering firms. They may be hired on by like the Department of Transportation to build a long range plan. I do modeling or analytics. So I'm, I'm working with a lot of contractors as well. We may have like a marketing program through like a, a comptroller's office um, for a 529 plan. So we'll segment out maybe homes that have kids or homes that have grandparents present. We'll do like an email campaign um, on behalf of them. Our government division is a very small portion of our company. In general, it's a we're obviously a marketing-based company. So a lot of firms like, you know, a big-time company wants to do a, a direct mail campaign or a, an email campaign or digital display. You got all these different types of marketing programs these days. 
that's what the bulk of our company's doing. I'm in the government part. Yeah. So yeah, to answer your question, yeah, we do sell to anybody. Yep. Okay. So, okay, so if I'm, if I'm hearing your uh, question correctly, so let's say we have an apartment building and there's 50 units, I would have a record for each unit. So in unit, unit one, I've got Mary Jo lives there and, and all, all their demographic data, you know, uh, three occupants, income, presence of children indicator, lifestyles, all that stuff. Unit two, it's Joe Schmo. Unit three, it's Cam Draper. Unit four, it's Richard Wade and, and all their information. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh -huh. yep, we'll have them both. Yep, yep, absolutely, yep. Yeah, in fact, oh, the, we can even, don't go ahead. I was just gonna say, in fact, the water development, I don't know who asked that question. Oh, the um, the water development board is actually working with CAM right now um, to identify population of buildings uh, during the day and then what the population of the buildings are at night. So if you had a, if you had a tornado blow through during the day, you get an idea of maybe how many people were in the area just based on the population of the building during the day. But if it blows the same area at night, it's much less so you can you can identify the impacts much quicker that way. And the same with houses, you know, people go in, are they working from their home and that right. kind of stuff? Am I getting that yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So another another data field on our commercial database is hours of operation. So if your hours of operation is nine to five and we're telling you that there's 30 people that are in this building from nine to five, we know it's much lower after five o'clock because most are going home. So you may have, and then depending upon your industry type. So if it's like a call center, you may have more staff at that building at night because they're calling 24 hours a day. Whereas if it's a, a law firm, five o'clock, you may have cleaning crew in there and that's it, right? So, yeah. Yeah, we can, if, if, if the address is 1000 Congress Avenue and there's residents and businesses in there, Based on the address, we can tell you if it's a resident, we can tell you if it's a business. We split, we split the databases up. So we'll have a commercial data file and a residential data file. Yep. Any other questions? I'll try to get this web tool up. Yeah, I think you might've missed a C up there. What did I miss? Oh, I did? Yep. Go figure. So this is our online tool. Um, again, in GIS world, it's typically the raw data file, the offline database that we create for our users. But I don't know if I can do this and type, but we'll do my best. Um, well, however, we do have a significant number of uh, government agencies that do prefer our online tool. It's more for your ad hoc research. You're creating uh, customized databases on your own and then exporting the data. Cam, do you want me to hold the mic while you type? No, that, it's okay. You're good? It's okay. I hunt and peck anyway when I type, so. Let's see. Yeah. Does that work? No, of course not. Can everybody hear me? Oh, it's the audience, the online. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, so on this database, again, um, we provide different modules. So you'll see there's a US business. Oh, and again, um, I guess going back really quick in regards to our, our commercial and our residential database, we do have historical uh, years. So we can go all the way back to 1997 for business and back to 2005 for residential. Um, in a lot of cases with a lot of our government agencies, they are looking for benchmark years. So maybe they want 2000, what did Texas look, businesses look like in 2010? And let's compare it to 2023, right? So we have a US uh, historical, we do have Canadian 
Um, we have a new business database in the U.S. healthcare on the consumer side. Um, again, there's your consumer lifestyles, which is the bulk of our consumer database. And then the other one that would sometimes be important is U.S. Uh, new movers and homeowners. So I'm going to show you a couple of things here. We can do, for example, a quick search. So again, if I wanted just a list of, let's say Starbucks in Austin. Oh, I can't spell. On the online tool covers all 50 states and the islands as well. So here, um, we just created a database of Starbucks locations in Austin. Um, a couple of things you can do here that's kind of unique is there's corporate linkage for starters. So if I wanted to identify where this Starbucks location, who their corporate, uh, their headquarter parent is, I can click on that up arrow. And I I've identified that Starbucks Corp is out of Seattle, Washington. Um, we can do just the opposite with a down arrow. I can click on that and I can identify that Starbucks Corp has got 15,594 Starbucks locations that fall under its umbrella, right? Um, I've got the capability to go into these detailed records and this is more of that. So when I, we were talking about those file layouts that I was showing you, this is the online version of it. This looks a little prettier. So you've got your location information, address, phones, fax numbers. We've got links to their social media on this. Um, we even list job openings. Uh, there's your industry codes. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the SIC and NAICS codes, they're all mapped out here for you. So you can get the data for all of them. If I wanted to go back in and I wanted to, you know, I want to know about all coffee shops in Austin, not just Starbucks. So if you've got a server in here, it's a great news coffee shop, right? You can do that with any industry, churches, schools, police departments, whatever you want. So again, it's not just for-profit businesses in our database. We got all your nonprofits as well. Um, demographic data. Again, this is your employee size, both location and corporate wide. We can tell you if it's publicly traded, private or nonprofit. Years in the database, we've got EIN numbers, uh, your annual sales, location type. We can tell you the last time I updated this record, not me personally, but September 2022, it's updated. Credit ratings, there's your hours of operation. Uh, your management directory with their titer, title, gender, and ethnicity. Got email addresses as well. <laughs> um, on the online tool, we have company news information, uh, the source of the article when it was published, links for the full text. Stock data, uh, business expenses, so how much they're spending in technology, utilities, payroll, historical data, it's their historical records. So if I wanted to see Starbucks back in 2005, I could do that. I've got items like UCC filings, uh, nearby business report, and competitors report. Um, the other cool thing about this online tool is, again, we talked about creating your own unique database, right? at your fingertips. So for instance, if I wanted a database of restaurants, and I don't know the SIC code, I can type in a keyword, <laughs> and it brings back every industry related to restaurants. There's restaurants, and I wanna uh, build a database of restaurants in Austin. Can do that. And I've got a database of 3,318 restaurants in Austin, but I could take it a step further. Let's just say I wanted to target restaurants in Austin that have less than 20 employees. Update my database count. Now I have 2,496, and when I'm ready for that, I can hit view results. Now let's say I wanted to export this to Excel. I can hit download, pick my uh, file format, my level of detail. So if I wanted to customize the fields that I'm exporting, let's just say I want uh, company 
name, address, lat long, and employee size, and maybe their primary NAICS code or SIC code. I could customize that. And here you can go and you know pick whatever fields you want to export. And then my last step is download. Download those 2,496 restaurants, export it right to Excel, and then load it right into your GIS software. Again, nine times out of 10, 9.5 times out of 10, uh, GIS clients of ours are, we're just building the database for them. And just the online tools. So. Yeah, yeah. Historical goes back to 1997 for business. Um, for the online tool on the consumer side, it's just current. Um, I can build you a customized uh, consumer database going back to 2006. Oh, I'm sorry, virtual people. Anyone else? Uh, you want? Do you want to take a peek at the consumer side? Is there any other samples you'd like to see? Sample searches you'd like to see on the uh, business side? Some of the features that you can use are customized search features to build your own custom databases. Um, Probably the most popular is business type. So putting a database together by industry type, uh, SIC or NAICS codes. Uh, geography, um, we've got any type of geography you want. We've even created a map-based search where you can draw your own uh, boundaries or import shape files. Yes. That's it. It's a good question. Um, it's quantity based and it's tiered. So I would kind of, I would need to know your target first. So is it a database of all businesses in Austin or all businesses across the United States or maybe, you know, just a certain type of business. And then what we, we run counts on what we've got. And then there's a tier for, there's ranges based on quantity of records. Uh, on the business side, anywhere from seven cents to a quarter a record. On the consumer side, anywhere from less than a penny to fourteen cents. We typically, I mean, we can work with you on on cost based on what you. So, for instance, a lot of times you don't need all 180 data fields on a consumer database or all 150 on a commercial database. So, if 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 there's certain fields that you want, we can work with you on that. Yeah. Are you with uh, uh, Austin Community College or? No, I'm with the Okay. Uh, okay. Anyway, we did a map-based search example here. Let's just use uh, Austin, Texas. So if I wanted to create my own boundaries, it's just a point and click. So I know in this little shape I just drew, there's 5,761 businesses. I've got radius. I could create a drive route. Um, I could import shape files. You can see here, I've already done some shape files for, for other clients. Oh, here's one for Texas Water. I don't think it's in Austin though. Um, so that's kind of a cool uh, little search function. You, you, as you can see, any type of geography, city, state, metro area, zip codes, radius, county, um, we can search for, we can put, uh, build databases by number of employees at a location, sales volume. We've got ownership types. So if you just wanted to build a database of headquarter or single locations and pull out all the branches. So say you don't want all those Starbucks branches, you just want headquarters, go ahead, right there. We do, we do have, yes, we do have the capability. Yep, yep. Uh, 
if you wanted a database of home-based businesses, we've got all sorts of stuff. Actually, as of about four months ago, we've added uh, indicators for female-owned businesses, uh, veteran-owned businesses, and minority-owned businesses. So that's brand new data that we've we've added here just in the last six months. Um, if there are any more questions on the business side of things, I'll give you a quick peek of the consumer. Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, consumer. It's the same search functionality. We have that quick search and we have an advanced search. Um, obviously by geography, uh, we can put uh, databases together by home value. So if I just wanted a database of uh, homes that were, you know, over 500,000, I'd have the ability to do that. Uh, I can do by home income. I can do by lifestyles. So consumers that are interested in all these different lifestyle attributes. And then I've got uh, snapshot data like age. So if I wanted, you know, homes that were under 25 or over 65, uh, marital status, children present. So again, for like a 529 program, right? If I just wanted to target homes that had kids and everyone knows 529, right? College savings programs. Anyway, you'd be able to put that database together. Um, ethnicity, gender, uh, mortgage present. Uh, you just wanted to target homeowners grandparents present in the home, et cetera. Again, online tool versus offline, 9.5 times out of 10 with GIS, we build the database for them. Um, a lot of like economic development departments use this online tool. Any questions? I know I'm probably running over time at this point. It's 4.03. Any, any additional yeah. questions, anybody online? Not in this database, no. Um, we do have them, uh, and it's uh, it's something we would build into like a custom file for like law enforcement. So, so that actually brings up a good question, Cam. How, how do you keep this out of the hands of somebody who's going to do something not good with it? So this online tool is uh, we can either IP authenticate it for access or we set up username and password. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. But, but do you vet the individual asking? So, any... so for this product right here that I'm showing you, we only provide for government agencies. Like okay. I can't go to or, or ABC lawn mowing company can't license this government tool for, for use. We have a we have a tool that we do provide for the public that has a lot less sensitive data in it. Right. Um, that will license to uh, an ABC lawn mowing or a, we have a public library product as well that that's available for the public. But again, the sensitive data fields are not present. Okay. If so, somebody said, I want the social security numbers. I want this. No, the answer is no. No, no. no. Yeah. no. Okay. All right. No. Just curious. <laughs> yeah. Um, and my, I've been with the company for 20 years. Uh, we had an online tool at one point for law enforcement called Secure USA, and we recently got rid of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, again, that was your police departments, sheriff's departments, district attorneys, um, agencies like that, that have a need for that type of stuff. Um, but we've gotten away from it. Yeah. Any other questions for Cam? No. All right. Uh, if we could give Cam a, a warm round of applause oh, for, no. for being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Cam. Thank you. And, you know, I think it's it's extremely fascinating. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm intrigued and horrified about all about this at the exact same time. Um, that all, all of that's in there. But when you look at when you look at how valuable it can be, specifically, for example, a major flooding scenario, and they need to find out what houses might have like people who are disabled. Um, you could use a tool like this to go through those areas and and determine. Uh, which houses we should go through first and check on the the well-being of of individuals. So, uh, you know, it's it, you know, you first look at it, you kind of go, why would anybody need that? But that's why, you know. Yeah. So for like 911 emergency. So for for 911 for emergency, uh, you know, preparedness uh, response and recovery. Um, you know, in the preparedness portion, you're looking at okay, <laughs> for first responders, where do where do we want to send them to first? Right, schools. 
nursing homes, retirement centers, homes with kids, people that need assistance get homes with the elderly. Um, so it gives them an idea of where to go first, right? And then in the recovery portion, you're actually getting them and then where are you gonna send them to? So you're identifying locations out of the hazard zone um, that can maybe fit large quantities of people. Uh, again, schools, auditoriums, stadiums, churches, and then you know where are your closest uh, food outlets, gas outlets, clothing outlet outlets um, in regards to the uh, response portion. And then the recovery would be assessing the damage. So if this block got wiped out, right, and you know on this block there's a law firm, a gas station, uh, a school, um, a CPA firm, a, a grocery store, and then you have all that demographic data behind those business locations, like, okay, we know the X number of employees are in this location, X number in this location, we know the industry type, we know their annual sales volume, we can begin to assess damage, right? And then on the same on the residential side, you can begin to assess the damage. We know that an apartment building was wiped out, um, a, a whole, you know, three blocks of homes were wiped out. And you have all that information like home value, home type, home income, um, you know, how many residents were affected. So you can begin to assess the damage as well. Pretty good. Thank you, Cam. Really appreciate it. Yep. All right. Uh, well, again, thanks, uh, everyone. We got a couple more things here to just finish up here. Let's see if I can get ourselves back online. Uh, can I? Or is it already up? Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, here we go. I got it. All right, and uh, so we're going to close out real quick just to say that we are all going across the street to uh, the Brutorium. If you can uh, join us, please come. Um, I was I was just telling Cam, I said, we got we got to go there because they have amazing pizza. If nobody's ever had their pizza, it's like crazy good. We were going to do pizza at lunch and we decided, no, let's we'll do pizza this evening. Uh, so we're going to all be meeting over there after this at 430. So please uh, join us. Uh, I don't know if Courtney Rowe is online and if she is, she, if she wants to say anything. No. Um, so, you know, special uh, thanks to uh, Eurissa and the Swidges folks for putting this together and always uh, supporting this event. And uh, and then I think lastly, I got a giveaway um, to do here for the people in person. And Christine, how do you how do you want to do this? Am I drawing? All right. Scott Friedman. Hey. Oh, oh, I'm supposed to draw first. Sorry. Watch it actually be watch it actually be Scott Friedman. Corresponding name. All right. This this all right. You are not key. You No. What number is that? Two. Scott Friedman. <laughs> that is crazy. Oh, fine. I can't do that because now it looks too rigged. It's too, too rigged. That actually is really freaky. Number seven, Judith. Is it Judith Men Menzel? Judith, woohoo! Got a pop-up cooler. Thank you, Judith, for, for being here. Um, anybody last minute questions of anything, anything they want to say? Announce. All right. So just so you know, these are the last set of meetings we're going to have April 19th. Please mark that on your calendar. Please try to be uh, over at, I think that one's at TechStot. Um, July 19th will be the next one. Then October 27th is actually the forum. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Thanks for everybody for being here. We really greatly appreciate it. Sorry for the, for the little glitch. We're getting that fixed up. Thanks again.